Hello, and thank you for joining CADRE's webinar titled Self-Care Strategies for Families with Children with Disabilities, presented by Missy Longman. Today's presentation is one in our continuing series of valuable CADRE webinars. A few technical notes. Phone lines have been muted to minimize interruptions. At any point during the presentation, you can enter any questions or comments into the question box, not the chat box, please, and you would enter those on your control panel. CADRE staff will be monitoring comments and questions throughout the webinar. The PowerPoint for the webinar is available in the handout section of the control panel and on the CADRE website. We are so extremely fortunate to have Missy Longman with us here today. Missy is a mother, advocate, and co-founder of the SMS Research Foundation. Her 12-year-old daughter, Sienna, lives with a rare genetic disorder called smith magnus Syndrome, SMS, which causes global developmental delay, challenging behaviors, and chronic sleep issues. Missy co-founded the SMS Research Foundation nine years ago to help direct much-needed funding to the study of SMS in order to develop treatment options to improve the lives of those living with SMS and their caregivers. In addition, Missy authors the blog, Rarely Perfect, and her posts have been featured frequently on The Mighty. Thank you for joining us, Missy. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you, Amanda, Noella, Melanie, Diana, and everybody with Cadre for this uh, tremendous opportunity to speak on um, a topic that um, I'm really passionate about. Um, so good morning to everyone on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you who join me down in, on the East Coast. I'm coming from sunny South Florida, about 68 degrees and sunny, not to rub it in. I promise you we definitely get our payback in September when you all are feeling nice fall weather and we are suffering in the height of hurricane season and sweat and humidity. So. Um, as we begin, I think um, it's really important, first of all, to discuss, before we can talk about self-care, we need to talk about what uh, self-care is not. We need to be able to define it. And our culture, our current culture, will have us believe that self-care is something that has a price tag, something that we have to pay for. It's the bubble bath, it's the bottles of champagne, it's the chocolate, the shopping sprees, the pedicures, the indulgences in life. Um, not the stuff that we need, but the stuff that's extra. And for those of us who are um, caregivers of children with special needs, we automatically disqualify ourselves as candidates of anything extra because we're already super overwhelmed by uh, the obligations and the challenges that we face on a daily basis. So I would argue that self care is. Uh, not only not self-indulgent, it is absolutely an act of survival, especially for those of us who are caregivers of people with challenging needs. So in my quest to redefine self-care, I think that self-care for us um, has actually a lot of different definitions. And I co-moderate um, a, a self-care group for Sienna's uh, diagnosis uh, with parents from all over the world that join it. And we are constantly kind of trying to reframe our day in the context of uh, self-care. Self-care can be many, many different things throughout our day. But overall, I would say that self-care essentially is about, it's about reclaiming our joy. So many of us have lost um, that joy. It's about rebuilding our health because we are putting um, other people's needs ahead of our own. We're not paying attention to our own health. Um, rediscovering ourselves, what we love, um, who we are. Our definition of ourselves becomes a caregiver and um, there's very little room for other things. So who, who are we aside from a caregiver? And redefining what a meaningful life is going to look like for us. Um, Rescripting. Um, you know, letting go of some of the things that, that, we, that we've lost on the journey and um, redefining a new, a new definition of what it's going to look like. And most of all, self-care is about strengthening our core. And um, I use this term because if you look at uh, people in, in um, fitness and coaches and um, trainers, 
they talk a lot about the importance of having a strong core. Your core is what, um, what gives you good form. Your core is what keeps you balanced. It stabilizes you. And we really need um, to have a strong core in order to be stable um, throughout the rough uh, storms and the day-to-day -day challenges that we face. So I really hope at the end of this discussion um, and this conversation that um, you're able to take away a few things. Number one, I hope you get um, some, find some tools for managing anxiety and depression. These are two uh, really prevalent um, mental health issues that I think uh, caregivers of, of children and adult children with special needs face. Um, and I do have some tools to help manage that. Some ideas for how to begin building um, your core or increasing the strength of your core. Um, some reassurance and encouragement that you are not alone. There is a whole world of people out there, um, a community of people who are dealing with a lot of the same issues that you are dealing with and struggling just like you are um, trying to figure out your own uh, path to self-care. It is really an ongoing discussion. This is not like a, there's not really an end to it. I can tell you I've been on a self-care journey for 12 years and I still don't have it all figured out. I still have more questions than answers sometimes. So um, it's just kind of adding to the toolbox every time we get a chance. Uh, and then I hope that you walk away with some questions to begin asking yourself. This should be the beginning of, a, of some self-exploration for you. And um, the changes and things that you can realistically do in your life to um, achieve some goals. And I set a few goals for us. Um, I'm a big believer in setting attainable goals. I don't like to fail, so I like to pick goals that I can actually achieve. And I think that these three goals are achievable. I think that we can increase our endurance. Um, we are in this for the long haul. Uh, my daughter will be under my care for the rest of her life and mine. So I need to build on that endurance. Uh, resilience, and I'm gonna talk a lot about resilience a little later in the, um, in the presentation. And just an overall improved quality and outlook on life. Um, I'm not expecting you to walk away from this singing and twirling in the hills as uh, Sound of Music style. Like, that's not the goal of this. This is really just to move ourselves in the direction of an overall uh, improved and better feeling uh, quality of life and a better outlook overall on what direction our life is headed in. So a little bit about myself. Amanda um, covered a lot of my background already, but this is my family. My husband, Dan, my daughter, Sienna, who we've already mentioned, uh, she's 12 years old. Then in the red shirt is my son, Sean, he's 11. And then um, the little, little guy in the middle is my four-year-old, Ben, and he is my little bubble and ball of energy and excitement, and he keeps us all on our toes. Um, in addition to uh, co-founding the SMS Research Foundation, I also have a background in uh, social work. I have a master's in social work. This was pre-children. I worked in the field of hospice, uh, crisis care unit social work. And um, I also have a little bit of a background in pharmaceutical sales. I spent some time uh, with selling and marketing. So I have that as well. So Sienna's story, she was my firstborn child. And her pregnancy, um, my pregnancy with her was unremarkable to me at the time, but that's because I had nothing to compare it to. And, um, you know, looking back, there was definitely some red flags. Uh, when I was 36 weeks pregnant, the doctors um, in her one of her routine ultrasounds noticed that her ventricles were enlarged, and they were concerned about that. So they sent me to the hospital to get a fetal MRI, which at the time I didn't think was a big deal. But now looking back, I realize that it's not routine at all, and it should have been cause for alarm for me, but it really wasn't. I was so focused on having a baby and having a little girl, I wasn't really paying attention to um, what the severity of that probably meant. And coupled with this, um, the results of that were that they were in the upper limits of normal and she actually looked really good on the MRI. So there really wasn't a big concern until around 38 weeks, um, they determined that she, I was uh, having intrauterine growth restriction, IUGR, and they wanted to induce because she had stopped growing essentially. 
So she was induced. But um, her APGAR scores were great. We were sent home after two days. Everything else, like I said, was really unremarkable. It wasn't until about her two-week checkup when um, the doctor noticed uh, a heart murmur and sent us to a pediatric cardiologist who diagnosed her with two very large holes in her heart. And we understood that she was going to need surgery, but the intention was she was very small when she was born. She was five pounds. She um, was still very tiny at the time of the, the heart diagnosis. And the intention was to allow her to gain some weight before she could uh, have the surgery because the cardiac surgeon didn't want to do a surgery on such a, on such a tiny baby. He would, he would prefer to hold off. However, she was going into congestive heart failure. She was actually losing weight. She was about four pounds, 10 ounces. And um, at one point, uh, we were feeding her one day, and she turned blue and stopped breathing, and we called we called 911. And at that point, we checked into the children's hospital down here in Miami and uh, waited our turn for uh, the surgery. So she had the surgery, and the surgery was successful. Um, this picture that you see to the right is me holding her for the first time three days after she uh, was removed from the ventilator my first time holding my brand new baby girl after she just had open heart surgery and the geneticist walks in and tells us that she has uh smith mcgenna syndrome and she completely altered the trajectory of our lives forever with that information so of course the geneticist tells us not to look it up <laughs> that we should just go home and love her, but no, we did look it up. We needed to know what we were dealing with. And this is what we found. smith mcgenna syndrome, also known as SMS, is a microdeletion of the 17th chromosome. Um, it has many, many characteristics. I've limited them here, but um, I've only listed the really major ones. Global developmental delays, uh, cognitive impairment, there is a severe behavioral phenotype associated with it, including attention-seeking behavior, self-injury, aggression, meltdowns through adulthood, um, a significant sleep disorder. They call it an inverted circadian rhythm. It basically means that her melatonin spikes during the day and drops at night, which is the opposite of our normal circadian rhythm, which means that she inevitably um, has some daytime sleepiness and uh, nighttime waking. And also a whole slew of medical and health issues, which unfortunately for Sienna, in the first three years of her life, she had several surgeries, um, things like a tethered spinal cord, uh, torticollis, she had two eye surgeries for strabismus, um, tons of ear issues, ear infections. We still battle to this day at age 12. Um, uh, we've had, I can't even tell you how many ear tubes we've gone through. Um, she had to wear orthotics. She had, I mean, we've, it, she's been through the gamut. So the doctor tells us to take her home and love her. However, after reading all of this, we felt instantly a profound sense of loss. We were in the throes of grief. It was physical, painful grief. and. Um, what I find so interesting, especially looking back, is that, and especially having a bereavement background, you know, when, you're, when somebody dies, when you actually physically lose a loved one, grief and the grieving, there's a process to grief, and, there, and grief is accepted, um, and of course, very normal. However, it gets complicated when you are grieving somebody who is still alive, and it is incredibly normal, but it is not quite so acceptable. And we learned that almost instantaneously. We were not given at the hospital any resources, um, contact person, any professional to help us process that grief. Um, nobody was there to help us, to help normalize or validate the grief that we were feeling. And even outside of the hospital on our return home, we found um, really that it was nobody was really able to help us work through it. So what do we do? <laughs> well, I think we did what probably all of you have done, 
and that's because we are incredible advocates and um, parents for our children, is we threw ourselves in to making things okay. That became our number one job, right? We have to make everything look okay, feel okay. We have to give them the best shot that they have at um, a good life. So we started with the therapies, the OT, the PT, the speech therapy, the behavioral therapy. We've done hippotherapy, every kind of therapy under the sun, you, you name it, we did it. Um, and then of course, all of the medical issues on top of that, trying to fix all of the things that um, internally and externally were, were going on there. And then in the meantime, really trying to normalize and build our family and our lives and, you know, adding to it. I had uh, gave birth to my son, Sean, 16 months after Sienna was born, six years later had Ben. And also really trying to um, build a sense of hope for ourselves and, and contribute, um, you know, to the population by starting the SMS Research Foundation. So we're doing all of these things. And on top of it, in the midst of all of that, we are learning how to manage um, these intense behaviors. And with Sienna, the way that SMS manifests in her life really hasn't changed much since the age of three. She's matured for sure. There's been a lot of growth and a lot of progress, um, and I would never try to minimize that. However, um, her needs have not really changed. She requires constant supervision. When she's left to her own devices, she can be quite destructive. Um, she can rip up books that she loves, things that belong to her brother, she can tear apart. She can, um, the kitchen, now that she has access to things like the stove and the refrigerator, you know, that's uh, problematic for us. Um, and she's also a lot smarter now, so she can figure things out a lot quicker. So it, it, it makes the destruction actually a little bit worse as she gets older. But, um, and then in, in public, um, we, we battle with, she has no stranger danger. She will walk up to um, people that she doesn't know, and everybody is her best friend. And it's actually really sweet and really endearing. And I'm always so thankful that the majority of people are super kind and receptive to her, and I appreciate that. However, I um, have to be on constant guard because as she's hugging somebody, she's also pulling off their glasses, taking off their hat. She's a total pocket picker. Like she will pull a wallet out of somebody's purse or a phone. She's obsessed with phones and she will take people's phones right out of their hands. Um, so so what it, that, where that puts us is in a constant state of hypervigilance, right? I mean, we cannot leave her alone for a second. And you learn to stay three steps ahead, but um, you're always on alert. And it is mentally and physically exhausting. And my body let me know that. So about three months after my son Ben was born, I was coming out of my newborn uh, kind of, you know, breastfeeding around the clock coma. And I was having lunch in a deli with two of my girlfriends. And I remember just feeling elated that day because I was finally out among the living. Ben, I mean, Sean and Sienna were at school. I just had my baby. He was sleeping in my arms. And I had just finished nursing him and my friend was telling a story and there we were at the deli just having a nice time and in the middle of her story all of a sudden I just felt this weird uh, tingling in my left arm and it, it wouldn't go away it just kept kind of building to the point where I stood up because it was kind of alarming me. my first thought was I think I might be having a heart attack and um, almost immediately as soon as I stood up my chest got super, super tight, and it felt like somebody was covering my mouth. I couldn't breathe. I was trying to grab breath, and I just wasn't getting oxygen. And at the very same time, all of the, it was like my system was shutting down. My, my hands and my feet got completely numb, and uh, I had, my heart was racing and pounding so loud that I couldn't even hear the other sounds in the deli. I could only hear the blood flowing through my brain. And I felt really dizzy, like I was going to pass out. So I handed Ben to one of my friends and said to the other one to call 911 because there's something really wrong. So 911 came, the ambulance came, and they brought me out to the car and to, well, to the, you know, ambulance. 
And they started taking all of my vitals. And in the meantime, I'm still going, I'm still experiencing all of these physical symptoms. And they start taking my vitals and he says, your oxygen is at 100% or 95%, whatever, super high, it's totally normal. Your uh, blood pressure is perfect. Your heart rate is perfect. You are physically okay. And I said, no way, you are missing something. I need to go to the ER immediately. I am definitely dying. So I went, uh, I had them take me to the ER. I left my baby with my friends. I called my husband, called my parents. Um, they, they all met me at the hospital. And within 10 minutes, the nurse administered a shot. And seconds later, I felt totally fine. And I looked at her and I said, what was that? And she said, that was Ativan. Um, being in the healthcare field, well, you probably don't even need to be in the healthcare field to know that Ativan is for anxiety. And I just could not get over it. I couldn't understand why a shot for anxiety would help me. And when we spoke to the, to the doctor uh, during my discharge process, when uh, he was explaining what was going on, he said, you know, you had a massive panic attack. And my mom, this is actually kind of funny. My mom was in there with us, in the room with us. And she, she looks at him, she goes, what? She's handling everything totally fine. What do you mean she's had a panic attack? And he said, he looks at her and he goes, excuse me, um, ma'am, with all due respect, but your daughter is in the ER for a panic attack. She is not handling everything okay. So sure enough, I had all of the symptoms. And if you've had a panic attack, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I had all of the symptoms of a panic attack and with no prior history of anxiety, no prior history of panic. I did not see this coming and I was completely astounded and actually still didn't even believe it. I went to a cardiologist to get a full workup. I did everything I could to try to figure out what was really going on because there's no way it could be that. Um, so uh, in, the, in the midst of all of that, actually, sorry, I'm gonna go back for one second. In the midst of all of that, Months throughout several months later, I had what I would call aftershock, where um, I would be in a store and all of a sudden I would feel the symptoms coming on and I would have to leave the store because I was so worried that I was going to freak out and have another panic attack there. It became so debilitating that, um, you know, I would call my husband and have him come home from work sometimes because I didn't want to be left home alone with the baby. Um, I would call my mom and ask her to come stay with me. I did not want to be alone and I really didn't want to go out in public. So it was becoming very, very debilitating for me. And I couldn't figure out what was going on with my body, why my body was so out of control. Well, it turns out there's a really good biological, physiological reason for that. That stems from my role as a full-time caregiver of somebody with, uh, with of an individual with um, special needs. And if you get a chance, I highly recommend reading the full article from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. Um, they measured levels of maternal cortisol in mothers of children with autism, and I'd like to add it was mothers of children with autism who demonstrated clinically significant uh, behaviors on a regular basis. I think the behavioral component is really important to remember and keep in mind because that for sure is um, the thing that throws the stress levels over the edge. Cortisol is the stress hormone that's released in our bodies uh, during, it's, it's the stress hormone that's released in our bodies in, in reaction to crisis. And it triggers our fight or flight instinct. Cortisol is, we basically have like a built-in alarm system in our body. So it's like, a, it's, it's like the red emergency pull that's behind the glass that you're not supposed to touch unless there's absolutely an emergency. When it's used chronically over and over and over again, and it's not supposed to be, it wreaks havoc on our bodies. And it causes a lot of health issues, including ding, 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 anxiety and depression. Also things like weight gain, which I know um, many of us struggle with, and um, memory loss, concentration problems. There's a whole list of stuff that comes with this chronic stress. Um, in this article, the maternal cortisol levels were significantly lower than normal, yielding profilers, profiles similar to those of combat soldiers and others who experience constant psychological stress. So we are like in combat. 
and we are losing our buffer. We are losing our resilience. Um, really, the longer that we, we do this job, I think um, the more we get, uh, our resilience gets blunted. So the first thing I wanted to do was really kind of reset my nervous system because I was so out of whack, I wasn't even functioning. And I needed to be able to function for my family and I needed to be able to function uh, just in my daily life. Um, so what I needed to do is get, get everything on the surface sort of figured out first. And um, I explored a lot of options. I want to say this list is all natural uh, ways to, to cope with um, immediate anxiety, with any, any anxiety that you're feeling now. It, I don't, didn't put medication on there because I am not a candidate for medication. I actually tried two antidepress antidepressants. That's the first line. I went to therapy immediately. They wanted to put me on antidepressant. I tried two of them. And unfortunately, I'm in like the 1% that gets side effects from any types of um, pharmaceutical drugs. So I, it wasn't, I wasn't a candidate for it, but this in no way discounts um, the importance of medication and the benefits that you can get uh, from being on, on a medication to treat your anxiety or depression. So it's just not on this list because it wasn't for me. But if it's for you, absolutely, please use it. So the first thing I did was I, um, I actually eliminated caffeine and alcohol. Caffeine for obvious reasons, um, the heart, you know, your heart rate goes up when you have caffeine. Alcohol, because alcohol is a depressant, and anxiety and depression really go hand in hand. They're like bride and groom. So, um, and I did notice that when I was having an, an, a panic episode or a uh, series of um, anxiety, that it, it was usually always followed or coupled with um, some depression. So I cut both of those out. Breaking a sweat daily is still a go-to for me. It's huge. Um, I need some place to put all of that adrenaline that's constantly pumping through my system. And I highly recommend uh, getting some kind of exercise routine in, into your day, um, whether it's walking, running, you know, biking, swimming, anything that um, gets your heart rate up in a healthy way will be good. Essential oils. I love essential oils. They're really grounding. And what happens in anxiety is um, it's, it's disorienting. You sort of disassociate from yourself for a little bit. And anything that can ground you and keep you really in the present and away from the, the dread that kind of overwhelms you with a panic attack is really good. And you have to experiment with scents because some scents can do the opposite and kind of throw you out of whack even more. Or they can just turn you off or put you in a bad mood. I love uh, wild orange and peppermint. Other people prefer more calming scents like lavender and cedarwood, but I just encourage you to kind of explore essential oils if you get a chance because the benefits of them are amazing. Supplements, I tried so many supplements. GABA Calm is 100% my favorite. Um, it's not on here, but CBD oil uh, is another one that I am a strong advocate of. I didn't put it on here because at the time it wasn't um, accessible to me, but um, now I find it very, very helpful. There's other things like passion flower, lemon balm, a ton of different adaptogens that are helpful. There's a product called Ceridin that's also a supplement, and kava tea I love. I drink almost daily. Really calming. Breathing exercises. Brene Brown teaches something called, excuse me, square breath. And she teaches it to children. So it's really easy to remember. And what we need is we need tools that we can latch on to when we're in the throes of a panic or anxiety attack that we can that are easy to remember because otherwise we won't use them. And the square breath is super easy. You just inhale four breaths, hold for four breaths, exhale four breaths, hold for four breaths. And um, that really helps to kind of calm and center you. And again, it's that grounding, that putting you back in the present moment and away from those feelings of dread. Um, I love the Calm. There's so many meditation apps, but I love the Calm app is my favorite. They offer like anywhere from 5, 10, 15, 20 minute um, meditations. And so just depending on how much time you have, you just pick one of those. Uh, the 10% Happier app is also really good. I think both of those apps cost money. There's tons of apps out there that don't. And also, by the way, just Sitting in peace for five minutes, like by a tree or a piece of a body of water or something, is the same thing, and you don't have to pay anything for it. Um, and sleep and nutrition are last. 
because I do think that those are probably our biggest struggles, but the ones that we know the most that we need to do, sleep was um, a non-negotiable for me from the beginning. Actually, when I read all of the characteristics of SMS and I saw that sleep was an issue, I totally freaked out because I love my sleep. I need my sleep. And um, I knew I needed to figure out a way to make sure that at least I got sleep in order to be able to function. And so we did the best thing for our family ever. When my, um, when my daughter transitioned out of the crib, we got a safety sleeper. And if you are not familiar with the safety sleeper, I would encourage you to look up the company. The owner is amazing. The, co the product is amazing. And it is absolutely life-changing. I do not sell the safety sleeper, but I, um, I promote it and advocate for it as much as I, every chance I get because it really changes your life. It, first of all, keeps your child safe and free from wandering the house, free from eating, free from getting into trouble in the middle of the night. Um, uh, for elopers, keeps them free from escaping the house. And um, for the rest of the family, it keeps all of us rested. Even if the child is not sleeping well, at least we are. And we need to be able to function and keep doing what we're doing every single day. So that sleep is really essential. And actually, what I have found with Sienna is that the safety sleeper has really created some excellent sleep habits in her. She sleeps, for the most part, every night from 8 to, I would say, about 6 a.m., sometimes earlier, sometimes later. But uh, I know without the safety sleeper, it, her sleep would not look like that. So the sleep hygiene that's created in them, I think, is really important, too. Nutrition does not have to be complicated. Most of, of your plate should have greens, some proteins, some complex, complex carbohydrates. You don't need to spend a lot of time, you know, counting things or measuring things or we good lord we have enough going on but um you know decrease sugar and um and uh things that come in a box so after i finally got all of my um my nervous system sort of calm and relaxed with those things i began to dig a little bit deeper into what was really kind of maybe behind some of what was going on that led up to that panic attack, aside from, of course, the obvious, the constant hypervigilance. What else I was looking at? And I did this with therapy. And um, what I found is that a lot of us, our stress reactions, our negative stress reactions, manifest themselves in, in some of these ways. Exhaustion, resentment, uh, regret, and guilt anger, short fuse, impatience, isolation, comparison. And all of these things are associated in some way, especially when we act on them, uh, with shame. And shame is really toxic. So when you peel back, though, when you peel back the layers of, of these stress reactions, what you ultimately end up finding is an underlying connection called grief. And so now we're back to where we were in the beginning. Um, and what happens, interestingly enough, I think, especially when you are caring for somebody who is still alive, this is grief, again, uh, not when somebody has passed, but when you are grieving over a, a, a life-altering um, diagnosis, is that you revisit grief again and again. Um, it comes up in waves and there are a lot of triggers out there that trigger grief. There are milestones. Um, Sienna's, you know, hitting that middle school puberty time right now. And there's a whole new sense of loss um, in this stage. Uh, things that I know that her peers are doing that she's not doing. Um, and grief, once again, that unresolved grief from the very beginning can become unresolved grief throughout our life if we don't stop and uh, figure out how to process it. So it's a really, really an essential part of the self-care that we do is processing our grief, talking about it when we feel like we're in the throes of it, um, having somebody that uh, can help us normalize it, and also help us connect some of these outward emotions uh, to the grief that we're actually experiencing.
So in addition to that, um, when, when we're talking, we're going to go back to building our core um, with radical self-care. And so now this is about trying to add to that resiliency that we've lost. Um, that study that I shared with you, really important point that I, that I don't want to forget to mention in that study is that the author made a point at the end of the discussion, during the discussion section, you know, when they talk about other things, the future uh, research that should be looked at. The author suggested that there should be a study done, a follow-up study with mothers only of children, of young children. So mothers in new, new early stages of uh, special needs parenting to measure their cortisol levels and see where they're at. And his hypothesis was that their cortisol levels are probably going to be normal or much closer to normal than the mothers that were previously studied. And I find that so interesting because what that tells me is that mothers, or not mothers, not just mothers, I'm sorry, I keep saying mothers, it's really caregivers. Caregivers of adult children with special needs really require much more support and resources, um, first of all, than they're getting, but um, possibly even more than caregivers of, of younger children. And if you look at our, our culture and what's currently offered right now in our country, it looks quite different. There's a lot of resources poured into uh, early intervention, and um, um, there's a lot of support in those younger elementary years. But once the child ages out of the school system, those resources significantly diminish. And um, I think that, that if, if you are a professional on this call and you're listening to this, I hope that um, you know, there are people out there who are willing to, to change that and to, to do something about that because caregivers of adults, uh, of adult children with special needs really, really require a lot more support than we are providing them at this time. So what we can do for ourselves is we can try to help to build that core with radical self-care and we can, we can increase our resiliency through many different things. We've already talked about a lot of these, therapy, medication, essential oils, um, decreasing and eliminating social media, especially if we're feeling particularly uh, vulnerable or fragile. Um, social media is a wonderful way to connect and feel less isolated, especially if you are homebound most of the time. It's a great way to find people who um, are going through your similar situation, but it becomes unhealthy when we start comparing um, our real lives to other people's Facebook life, and um, even within the world of special needs and comparing our own children to somebody else's child who has the same disorder, but maybe we think looks like they are higher functioning or doing more, or able to do more. And then we start to add that guilt, um, that feeling that maybe we should be, we're not doing enough, and it can become a really negative spiral for ourselves. So if you find yourself in that situation, I would definitely encourage you to at least drop it for a little while and see how you feel and see if that helps lift your mood a little bit. Support groups are essential. Um, if you can find one that is uh, specific to your child's disorder, I strongly suggest that. I think the more specific it is, the, the more relate, relatable um, the, the, the people in the group are. But um, any kind of group that you feel like you are heard and can share and open up about um, what's going on internally is very beneficial. The physical aspect, the physical piece is the exercise, it's the gardening, it's the nutrition, the hydration, the proper sleep, playing with your pet, the snuggles and the cuddles, um, your emotional and spiritual, your emotional and spiritual piece is journaling. Um, it's prayer and meditation, um, it's mindfulness, paying attention to our thoughts, and I'm going to get back to that in a little bit because it's really, really, really important component of self-care is um, what we are saying to ourselves. Gratitude. Um, my family and I this year just started, I got one of those really giant water bottles, 
and I put it in the uh, kitchen with a notepad and some and some pens next to it. And everybody has to write something every day, something that happened in their day that they're thankful for, or somebody or something, um, so that we can fill it up and by the end of the year, um, take a look at all of the things um, in our life that we have to be thankful for. Hope. Uh, our, the SMS Research Foundation has been an incredible source of hope for me personally. Um, when I can look towards the possibility of things rather than uh, feeling stuck in what is, um, that definitely gives me a better outlook on life. Um, and then my relationship with my friends, my spouse, my family, you know, we, we tend to isolate ourselves sometimes and it's important to really maintain those connections with the people who really love us and care about us. And then anytime you're in nature, any, any chance that you get to interact with nature can add to your toolbox. Okay, so we, we talk a lot about lack of time and lack of resources. So first of all, when you look at this group, I really tried to only pull out things that don't really cost any money. Therapy is, is probably the most expensive thing on there. Um, everything else, is essentially free. So it's not really a financial issue. And in terms of time, these, some of these things can be done speckled throughout your day. It can be done in chunks of five minutes even. Um, it doesn't even have to require a ton of, of your time either. So I think a lot of times how the roadblocks that we face and how we end up sabotaging our ability to practice self-care is one of two things. And I'm bad at both. <laughs> So I can admit that. Uh, number one is saying no to the stuff that we don't want to do or the stuff that doesn't serve us. Um, we have to prioritize ourselves. We don't want to disappoint people. I understand that. I'm, I'm the same way. I don't like to hurt people's feelings or disappoint. And I also want to get that invitation again. So I hate saying no because I'm afraid that that's going to discourage somebody from asking me again. But at the same time, if I'm going to, you know, make these other things a priority and, and I want to engage in some of these things in order to feel good, um, then I'm, I'm going to have to say no sometimes to people. Um, and then my really, really hard one is asking for help. There are people who are willing to help, uh, are willing to give us a break, uh, willing to take on some tasks for us, um, and we've got to be able to tell people uh, what our needs are. They can't guess, and um, sometimes that's my expectation is that people can figure it out on their own, but uh, we need to give people some guidance. The people who love us in our lives, we've got to give them a little bit of guidance in terms of what would help be helpful for us. So back to self-talk, and I made this own slide because to me, this is number one. To me, this is the most important thing, the most important act of self-care that we can uh, give ourselves and we can start it immediately. And um, therapy does actually really help in this department. And again, I would encourage if, if you're able to do it, uh, I would, especially if you find that your self-talk is extremely negative. But we narrate our life story every single day. If you stop and listen to your thoughts, you are telling a story of everything you see, interact with, experience. And the way that we tell that story to ourselves is going to determine the way we see and perceive our lives. Self-talk is going to determine uh, our self-worth and how, we, how, many, how much we value ourselves. Our self-talk is going to determine um, our, our level of self-compassion when we mess up, when things don't work out perfect, when we lose our temper, how much grace are we offering to ourselves? Are we talking to ourselves like a friend? Or are we putting ourselves down constantly about all the things that we are, all the ways that we're falling short? Self-talk also really dictates how empowered we are. Um, there's so much about this life that we cannot control. It's out of our control, and we've got to find the areas where we have some autonomy and where we can feel empowered. And we, it starts by what we tell ourselves we have, we have control over. Um, problem solving starts with the way that we talk to ourselves. So it's our life script. 
sometimes we need some help uh, reframing and re rewriting that life script. And again, like, like I said, therapy helps, um, support networks help. But sometimes even just sitting in meditation um, and listening to your thoughts and starting to get a, a sense of where your thoughts are going, you can just um, really start to learn how to reframe what you're saying to yourself about your life. So another tool that I think is really important to use when it comes to self-care is rediscovering uh, is rediscovering ourselves by finding joy in things um, that nourish us and nourish um, our spirit and our soul. And these are often things that used to, we used to find pleasurable, but then somehow lost touch with that along the way. And so it's hard sometimes to reconnect with the things that, that bring us joy. So I just listed a few questions to help kind of prompt or spark maybe some thoughts in your own uh, self-exploration for what might, um, might be the thing that helps you find your joy again. So things like what makes you feel most alive and in the moment? What activity have you participated in in the past where you actually lost track of time? You know, you hear about people who paint and like six hours later, they, you know, they weren't even thinking and all of a sudden the time just goes by and um, they have this painting in front of them. Um, what about an activity that you participated in high school or college that you loved but didn't pursue later because life got in the way? So anything that we were passionate about in our younger years, chances are we still have that passion there. We just didn't get a chance to follow through with it or pursue it. And then also, what about somebody that you admire? And is there something about them that you admire the most? Because it's possibly and probably something that needs to be birthed in you. And if you look towards other people that you tend to follow, maybe on social media or um, feel inspired by, what are those qualities and those traits um, in them that you aspire to have? And what are the types of things that you can do in your life to, to help you um, manifest those qualities in your own life? So again, self-care doesn't have to cost you anything. If I were to name my four top most important things that you could walk away from uh, today and, and, and do, number one <clears throat> would be to please, please give yourself permission to grieve whenever and wherever you need to um, and understand that grief is a process and it's an ongoing process and it's um, not something, you don't just arrive at acceptance and then it's over and done. That was something I believed early on and I would get frustrated every time I found myself spiraling into grief again. That I thought, I, why am I going around this now and again? Like I thought I got over that part already. Well, it doesn't work that way. And grief really needs to be processed. Um, so figuring that part out about where you can process your grief, um, contacts and people that you have in your life that can help you validate and normalize your grief, identify your grief, um, that's really, really important. Strengthening your core with all of those, the things that we discussed, monitoring your self-talk and the script that you're writing about your life, um, engaging in activities that really help to heal your adrenal system and your nervous system, calming your body down as much as you can in the time periods that you have to be able to relax and allow that part of you to heal. So we get asked a lot how others can help. And it's, uh, it's so much simpler, I think, than then we're led to then people think. I, I, I really think that we we tend to complicate these things. First and foremost, I think uh, caregivers of individuals with special needs really are looking for empathy and encouragement. Um, we're looking for somebody to help us normalize and validate our grief as well. Uh, grace, you know, we develop this sixth sense when it comes to judgment, I think we're so in tune with the way people perceive our children and how they're responding, how the world is reacting to our children, that we, we develop like this sixth 
sense of judgment and we can we can smell it a mile away and it it we also know when somebody is truly offering us grace. And I would just say that if there's a mom who isn't coming to all of the, you know, school events or doesn't want to be a room mom or the kid comes with messy hair or disheveled, you know, clothes or, you know, put yourself in, in, in that parent's shoes of how difficult it might be, you know, at home to take care of this child, to put a brush through their hair, to, um, they might be so exhausted in school when their kid is at school is the one time where they have a break. And um, so really just try, especially if you're a professional, to offer grace wherever you can and, um, and just give, give that parent the benefit of the doubt that they are actually really doing the best that they can and that this job is so hard and it is, um, it doesn't ever end. And um, there really is very little time away. There's very little breaks. So if you can, offer to take the child for an hour or so to get an ice cream or smoothie. You know, if you don't feel comfortable with that, offer to help in other ways. Make a meal for the family. Pick up a sibling um, from school and take them out. You know, oftentimes the siblings are not given uh, a certain level of attention because all the attention is on the child with special needs. And keep inviting. Don't stop. Like I said before, um, we may say no, but that doesn't mean we don't want to join, and it doesn't mean that next time we will, we will say no again. And just to know that people are thinking of you, this, um, it is very isolating to be a, a, a caregiver, a full-time caregiver, and just knowing that somebody is thinking of you is enough to make you feel like you're still a part of the community in some way sometimes. In terms of the, the community and what I think the community can do, um, I think we ha making available weekends and holiday uh, respite or uh, camps is huge. I actually have access here in South Florida. Our local JCC offers um, a winter camp that my daughter attended a few days of the winter break, not the whole time because we did go away, but she went for a few days and they did, um, you know, activities at the center and then they did field trips. It was just like summer camp except in the winter. And that kind of break for families is really huge. I find that weekends and holidays are the hardest for us because the schedules are all out of sorts and um, our children often really thrive on structure and it's very difficult to properly structure a weekend or the holidays, especially when you have other siblings involved. So I really think that the community at large should have um, more resources available that allow for parents to get um, or caregivers to get a break uh, during this um, difficult time. So one thing I hope that you take away from this too is that you remember that uh, healing is not linear. I wish that my roller coaster was as pretty and colorful as this one. Mine looks a lot messier and a lot floppier and I guarantee my drops are a lot uh, deeper than the ones in this picture. But with every, uh, you know, drop, um, there is a comeback. And I always seem to find new tools and new ways to cope that I didn't know before. Um, and I think that, that you learn a little something different every time you take a slide. And, it, and we are going to be able to do this. But you just have to keep in mind that Sometimes you're going to take a hit, but you will get back up again. And these are my contact uh, information and some more resources. It's the link to my organization, the SMS Research Foundation, the organization that I co-founded, as well as uh, my blog. I just want to thank you again so much for having me um, on this webinar, and thank you to Cadre. Thank you so much, Missy. We do have time for a couple of questions. Can you see that? Okay. Um, first question is, I'm a middle school special education teacher. What would be helpful in reaching out to caregivers? What would you suggest would be most helpful from that role? Um, I'd like to start a support group of sorts in our area. I think a support group is wonderful. Um, I think that uh, physical support groups, at least in my experience, 
um, ha are difficult a lot of times for uh, for parents to get to because finding ch because finding childcare can be a challenge. Um, so I do find that online support groups sometimes are uh, are a little bit more active at least. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to discourage you from forming a support group. I think having a support group bringing parents uh, together and caregivers together is really important um, and beneficial. But I also uh, you know as far as this list goes, I think even just for yourself, don't minimize uh, your own ability to be able to be a source of support. And really it comes with um, a lot of these things that I said early, earlier in this slide with the, with the empathy and the encouragement, making yourself available, um, just letting them know that they're doing a great job and um, making yourself available to be helpful if you can. Thank you, Missy. Um, another question. My question is, when, when, what, uh, sorry. When your daughter started attending school, did you find it harder at any particular age? My son is only three, but has a genetic disability called Noonan syndrome. He can't see it, but it affects his learning and delays, but is associated with, um, associated with anomalies in his heart and kidneys, as well as growth. Doctors say it may be attributing to a chromosome, contributing to a chromosome that has not been discovered. So I'm sorry. So the, the question, question is, that I find. Yeah, yeah. The question is, you know, uh, when your when your daughter started attending school, did you find it harder at any particular age? Um, you know, that's really hard to say. I I think. Um, her younger years were were harder for me personally, but this is such an individual experience. Our kids are all so different, and I can tell you, I, I am really connected within the SMS community alone, and all of our children have had different struggles at different um, stages of their life. So I would say school has has been really great for Sienna. I, I she tends to thrive in school, so. Um, really at no point during her school, her time at school has there been any major issues. Um, it's more um, issues that I face at home, really. So I would say, I think it varies. I don't even know that you, you could go off of my own personal experience because um, it changed, it's so different from child to child. Okay, um, next question. Um, how can we make sure that both mom and dad are getting enough self-care? I feel like as the main breadwinner and main caregiver, medical care, um, medical case manager, housework person, that I resent my husband taking time for hobbies and self. It feels impossible to get as much self-care as I need. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally get it. And um, I think that, um, you know, you, you, got to prioritize yourself and really demand it. Um, and if there's ways that you can sneak it in even throughout your day here and there before you, you know, it, it shouldn't, it doesn't have to require a ton of time. Um, but I also think that absolutely as, as a full-time caregiver, you, you've got to voice your needs and, and let your husband know that you know, this is a priority for your health and your your ability to care for yourself is, is really important because honestly, at the end of the day, if we're not taking care of ourselves, we are not going to be able to take care of our children. And uh, to me, that's a big wake up call and that's scary. And, and that is really what I learned from my, my issues with my panic attack is that if I'm not functioning, my home is not functioning. And so it's, there's nothing selfish about telling uh, your husband or the people who, who you live with that you need a moment to, to, to take care of yourself and to regroup. Time for one more question. Um, do you need to have a licensed professional at a support group? Is it mandatory to have a licensed professional available? Um, does the support group need to be registered via the state? No, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. Um, I am not a professional and I don't run professional support groups, but pro I think support groups, uh, there's different kinds of support groups. There are support groups that are run by a professional 
personally, uh, when it comes to support groups and talking to other parents of children or adult children with special needs, I prefer to only interact, not with the professional, but with the other parents. Sometimes professionals get in the way. But, um, but I think that, uh, you, I don't think you don't, you don't, you shouldn't have to register the support group, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to answer that. Uh, I don't know 100% that answer. Thank you so much, Missy. Um, a lot of thank yous on the, on the questions um, for your sharing your story and um, being so gracious with your time with us. Um, and everybody who listened, thank you for joining us today. Uh, your feedback is very important to us, so please click on the link in the chat box to fill out a very brief survey, Monkey, to evaluate today's webinar. We would greatly appreciate it here. Um, as a reminder, our next webinar, Beyond Mediation and Facilitation, Exploring Early Resolution Options, will be held in March. More information about that webinar will be available on the Cadre website in coming weeks. We look forward to joining us. I did want to also add that we had some folks asking whether or not this, this webinar will be archived, and the answer is yes. We will archive this on our website. Please give us the time to get it up there. And again, thank you, Missy, for your time. We sure appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.